listeners and readers of awardswatch.com. This is the Awards Watch podcast, episode 189. I'm your executive editor, Ryan McQuaid. Joining me today is our editor-in-chief, Eric Anderson. Hello. Dan Bayer. Hello, everybody. And Zach Laws. Hi there. What an eclectic, weird bunch of people all to come together in such a fortuitous circumstance. Uh, um, you know, much like a Wes Anderson movie, right? You know, wow. we're all perfectly centered in the. Middle we of are. We're all we're right down the middle. There's, there's, you know, no. It's all edited perfectly. Um, <laughs> we're here to talk about Wes Anderson's new film, uh, Asteroid City, that just uh, went wide this past weekend. Had its premiere at the Cannes Film Festival earlier this year, and we're also going to be giving out our our top five Wes Anderson films. He's got eleven films. 11 films to choose from. Um, I'm sure that we'll, we'll have a lot of fun doing that um, in the back half of the episode. But uh, I just wanted to give an update on everyone's favorite game, the AW Summer Movie Box Office. Mm. <laughs> the Summer Movie Box Office, which is getting closer to our third month, where next week we'll be literally in uh, July. So it'll be right in time for um for oh uh, a little movie called indiana jones and a little movie called mission impossible and then the the summer matchup of the year barbie versus oppenheimer and then it's not uh, really much of a matchup. which is <laughs> and then uh and then or we can literally have twice the showings of oppenheimer okay it's not really a fair matchup <laughs> mm, okay um and you say hey say that now but it's been really interesting the box office for the first two months of the year. Yeah, we kind of talked about this uh, last month a little bit, but now we've 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 got the tea leaves a little bit now, where we fully see that there's two films that have absolutely dominated. Um, it feels like, which is Guardians of the Galaxy, which has done exactly what we had kind of all figured it was going to do, even though it had a rough start. And then the big surprise, which was not a surprise for me. Uh, was uh, Spider-Man into, uh, across the Spider-Verse, which has done extremely well for itself, could make uh, close to $700 million worldwide, um, which is a lot, because that's definitely more than the first one. Eric, you, you've you been uh, looking at the updated box office totals with me on the spreadsheet that we have. Uh, yeah, I was going to try and update it today, but... It is updated as of right now, if you go and look at it. Um, is I it? Did up- yes, it is. Oh, I updated okay, it today. Yeah. I was yeah. okay. Good. I was like, wait a minute. All right. Yeah. <laughs> wait a minute. I I did not approve of these updates, um, but uh, it is so. Uh, just kindly, uh, uh, you know, take a look if you want to, Eric, and and see mm-hmm. you know, if you got any comments on what's I been can happening see the numbers, so far. And they are on the sheet. They they are, <laughs> there are numbers on there, mm-hmm. and they are. Our presumably correct i don't know i don't they know cr- how, what correct. your math is like you know <laughs> it's been it's... a very interesting summer the formulas have been made by eric so if he's getting mad at i don't at know math, it feels getting... kind of like common core i don't know <laughs> i don't really trust it so but yes um you you guys only have two movies uh and your you know box office points are already over a billion dollars we have mm-hmm. three movies and we're at 740 so mm-hmm. you know, those are those are the tea leaves. You you still have Oppenheimer and Indiana Jones and the Meg Two to come. Yeah, the Meg Two is uh, looking and, good. And the bomb pick of Gran Turismo. Bomb? Mm-hmm. It's going to sweep yeah. the nation. I don't know what you guys are talking about. We oh, we only have we have Wheels up. Mission Impossible, which are obviously you know the two things we're kind mm-hmm. of like holding on to save us mm-hmm. this summer. But it has been such a really unpredictable summer i don't think there's been very much about it that's been predictable other than you know being the flash doing terribly the flash (laughs) doing that bad like like almost shazam 2 level bad but yes even though we picked the little mermaid i there was definitely going to be international uh numbers that were not going to be super favorable they're not terrible and it's obviously going to make money for our game purposes back but uh you know it was definitely impacted i think a little more than we thought that it would be yeah i I mean it's one of those things where like i feel like spider-verse 
Mm. It's very much like Top Gun Maverick last year, where we all knew it was going to do well, mm. but not like that well. I mean, I remember, and this is just pulling stuff off the top of my head. Mm. Um, is that where it's from? The Dan Bayer <laughs> saying that like one Wonder Woman 1984 was the comparison for this sequel, then it, that's what it could be. So. I, what I, supreme? I, yep. I have never tape. used Wonder Woman in comparison to that. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't remember sequel that. Terms. So you, might have, terms. you might have to bring up the audio. Yeah. I, you know what? I might. Slice well, that and in for there. what it's worth, Wonder Woman 1984. Good Bad movie. movie. I Bad stand movie. by it. Good movie. Terrible release time. Try releasing a film about telling people that every they cannot have everything they want around Christmas. Yeah, that's going to be a flop. No. I think I think the thing that that kind of fair uh, was was interesting in looking at at those two specific titles from each of us is that both the Little Mermaid and Spider Verse have done better domestically than internationally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I yeah. I would say significant enough margins to be noticeable when you compare them to Fast, Fast X. X and Transformers <laughs> uh, and mm. even Guardians of the Galaxy, where. You know, when we do this game, especially for summer now, mm-hmm. uh, we're looking at at international numbers because we know they're going to be so much bigger. Uh, and and this was definitely a case mm-hmm. where it's turned. And, you know, they do each have non-white leads. So call that what you want, mm-hmm. which, well, to, which yeah. works itself out differently than like how fast X does. Well, that has a multi that has a, 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 a cast. Yeah. Very intentional one mm-hmm. as well um but it feels different well i think also what's been interesting about spider versus the no pun intended the legs that the movie has i mean it's the as of this weekend it is now the number one film domestically again, again mm-hmm. um, showing once again the sort of dominance of animation at least uh of known properties as well, animation this year yeah. because well even you know like um elementals weekend drop was not as bad as something the like Hulk the flash was good you yeah. know what i mean the yeah, 37 percent drop it's, it's actually really it's doing that's as, as best a scenario as could have happened for that initial week yeah if it makes its budget back just yeah. and breaks even on that in, in like overall now i'm talking domestically but overall international and and um and domestically then that might just end up being a, a big win for that thing which is it's yeah, not really like but that's you know <laughs> but i've no but i've seen some projections that it, that it could i i don't believe that that's going to be the case um and we talked about i believe that pixar problem last week so um but i, I am curious because you know i i tend to like look at my theaters and see how things are shaping out and looking and a lot you know and and it's actually kind of worked out for most part of like the anticipation of these movies and and whatnot so far and all four of those titles that we mentioned indiana jones and the dial of destiny barbie oppenheimer and mission impossible dead reckoning part one they've all got a good smattering of tickets that have been bought by audiences i think that you know obviously you know indiana jones and mission impossible have those ginormous budgets that you know if we were doing a multiplier like we're going to probably next year uh we would be very worried and possibly those might not even be picked at this point um but uh i think that they're gonna do at least break even on their budgets for both of those films and i think that they provide a lot for for audiences and i think those movies play really well internationally too and mm-hmm. so that could be another thing. Um, and Barbie and Oppenheimer, you know, Barbie, obviously, you know, they just had tickets go on sale this past week. So I and and they've done really well for their pre-sales. Oppenheimer Itch Stick is the um, exclusive IMAX runs, which is going to be big for its box office totals because it'll have that three week window that Mission Impossible and Tom Cruise has been trying to get, um, but won't get. So they all have their niche and it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I mean. Obviously, there is August, which has our two bomb picks, and then of no, course the Mag- mansion is like July twenty sixth. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's thanks a lot, Jamie Lee Curtis, for, for saying Oscar that win- That's Oscar winner Jamie Lee Curtis to you, Eric. <laughs> I bet she's no, going to she say that in like every that. interview now. You know, I mean, she's like, <laughs> she posted on like uh, on on her Instagram. Oh my god, Haunted Mansion comes out six twenty six. Like girl, 
It's yeah. seven twenty six. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Jamie Lee Curtis, go home. You're drunk. Bless her heart. Yeah, but it's a little less of a three hundred million dollar um uh lead for my team right now. But it's still very Yes, it is. But it's yes, still it it's kind of roughly around where we were last month, but it doesn't mean that this is over because there's I mean no. there's a ton of movies. No. Like uh, we had our play. top our top picks have yet to come out on our team. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and to be we'll fair, see. that Meg too, that might just be the difference maker when it's all said and done, because that thing's gonna make a lot of money. I look, I was the only one on our team who was like, I think we should seriously consider this because <laughs> look at how much the first one made. And they all shot me down because yeah. they thought the trailer looked crappy. So I will say that if it is because of the Meg 2 that your team wins. I will just go. Told you so. Dan Bayer <laughs> throwing his entire team under, under the bus. <laughs> he, he's driving the bus. <laughs> yeah, he's like, we're going off the cliff, Thelma and Louise style. I will oh. die with the Meg too. <laughs> Honestly, that trailer looks like so much fun. And I mean, yeah, it, that... was, it was it was before No Hard Feelings, which I saw yesterday with with the Normies, and they <laughs> loved it. They loved that trailer. It's. I'm telling you, it's a fun trailer. Good, mm-hmm. decent needle drop in there. Like you know, God, <laughs> like, I'm, it's. It knows exactly what kind of movie it's trying to be. It's not trying to be anything else other than that. And honestly, it's like the movie Fast X at times wishes it was. Like to be fair, like just in that trailer alone. Like I mean, he's literally kicks a, uh, a megalodon don't, don't, in the don't, face. Don't put it past the next two in the Fast <laughs> series to go. You know, sixty-five million years in the past, or like into the ocean with sharks. <laughs> I mean, Don't that's put it fair. Past them. Or to have Vin Diesel punch a car right in the nose. They I did, mean, they did the space thing, so nothing's off limits. Nothing. I mean, Transformers have the Transformers in the in you know in the Fast Universe mix. You know, yeah, but Jurassic Park and Fast are already in the same studio. It's it's the crossover Just event that we've always. I really do want to see Vin Diesel. Right at back of a velociraptor, I think that would be. Thank you. Cool. So do I. Yeah. Put wheels on him. Let's go. And what's sad is the velociraptor would be a better actor, which is crazy. So the the thing that no one knew is that the spring Adam Driver blockbuster sixty five is actually a prequel for Fast Eleven. <laughs> That's that movie came out this year, and it feels like a deep cut. That's just yeah. how much that movie has faded. You know, into... if we ever play the cinephile game, that's going to be the movie that <laughs> wins you the game if you have an Adam Driver card. You know what I mean? uh, I, I'm not sure that actually <laughs> is a movie or it came out, so I will need evidence <laughs> and some proof. And I know that it is a movie because our dear and not here Nicole Ackman has seen that movie in theaters so I she know was that the it one. Real. So she, she was, was the one, one. yes, yes. Got it. <laughs> she was by herself in that theater being like anybody else here anybody <laughs> she's having the time of her life <laughs> private screening for me oh my god all right well speaking of a movie that actually did pretty well for itself this weekend as we transitioned mm-hmm. is Asteroid City that's an Dude. understatement yeah, for, for Wes Anderson, well, Wes Anderson is a reliable box office grab. Like, may not be like somebody that's going to make like a hundred million dollars or two hundred million dollars, but he's going to make his money back at least, and and he has his audience. Movie made nine million dollars, which I know sounds like oh nine million dollars. That's nothing, but for his movies, yeah, that's actually pretty. That's I think the highest since Grand Budapest. For the this is highest of... opening, yeah. For the type of theaters that it's playing in. And I used yeah. to, when I was in high school, I used to work at an art house movie theater and Wes Anderson was always a reliable um, source in fact, of that was for us. That was last year, right? When you were in high school? Yeah, when I was yeah, in high school. Yeah, yeah. yeah, when you hired me straight out of high school. There you go. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like his movies are always specialty uh, releases. They are. Despite having like huge stars and you know, um, relatively big distributors behind them. But, you know, for the type of movie that this is, it is a significant chunk of change. Like, um, the theater I saw it in was packed on a Sunday night at 9.30. So, yeah. Um, and it does it does help also, too, that, like, the buzz for these movies when they're released, they go to New York and L.A. for a couple of weeks, and then they 
it, it's a trickle effect and and he's he's very reliable when it comes to the indie market and and i think a lot of people were kind of worried and hesitant because of french dispatch not doing so well but that was clearly a lot of films that year that was not doing particularly well post to uh, you know are are coming back to the theaters in the pandemic so it's nice to see that anderson's got a, a hit on his hands a little bit of a hit and um you know the reaction out of cam was was pretty good it wasn't like the most rapturous you know he's ever received but it was a it was a better than french dispatch that's for sure and mm-hmm. uh so asteroid city is his 11th feature stars half of hollywood which is great for him um and following a writer uh on his world famous fictional play after a grieving father who travels with his tech obsessed family to a small rural asteroid city and then a bunch of stuff happens in between i was uh, very 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 anticipating this movie because I, I i think that wes anderson is one of those uh gateway directors for a lot of people of our generation um he he has a style that is completely unique to his own his movies are beloved people absolutely love these movies and the actors that work with them love working with them because they work with them over five, six, seven movies. Sometimes they even work with them all the way at the start of their careers, like Jason Schwartzman, all the way into a movie like this. So Eric, I'm curious because you, you just got back from asteroid city. Yeah. I just uh, saw it. Just got off the bus. Yeah. And, and ran back up here, you know, cause you were at asteroid city and you came back anyway. Um, what did you think of the film? Also, what do you think of Wes Anderson overall, Eric? I've actually never talked to you about Wes Anderson. I love Wes Anderson. I love uh, directors with very specific styles, and they don't have to venture far out of it to, I don't know, to do something else. Sometimes if it just fits, it just fits. You don't need to be able to do every genre and style of of movie. So mm-hmm. I... I I love his. Um, I absolutely love this. I'm in love with it. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's so meticulous, like all of his things are, and I can't wait to see it again because all of his things require multiple viewings to, you know, just capture the level of detail whether it's production design or just the <clears throat> how rapid the the cadence of the dialogue is um i loved it i i loved it um i i think his i i just tweeted a few minutes ago i think his talent for getting young actors to absolutely be in step with these oscar winners and and ex- absolute veterans is incredible I, I love Jake Ryan. Um, perfectly cast as Jason Dorman's son. At, like, it's I mean, we all knew. Turn. We all knew from eighth grade, right? Like the second he came on screen, it's like, oh, Wes Anderson is going to take him, right? He's, like, yeah, that that, <laughs> that kid, that kid is like star quality, and absolutely yeah. was like a like a breakout in in eighth grade because of it. Well, he was also previously in Moonrise Kingdom. So it, yes. it's not a surprise, that, you know. No, but, I know. I don't mean yeah. it. And that but he has a, yeah, but I like, you think, know. I just think Anderson's ability to, to match find. Him up. And actually, all the young actors in this are fucking perfect. They're amazing. The triplets. Oh, my God. My God. The witch, a fairy, and a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> fucking crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Those girls are crazy. Um, yeah, no. Uh, I. I loved it. I loved Robert Yeoman's cinematography so much. Uh, I think not that it's one of my favorite Alexander Desplat scores, but the scoring uh, when Jeff Goldblum's alien comes down, well, just the alien. And then it's reprised later with Carl Johansson. Absolutely gorgeous. Mm beautiful yeah no that's great i really loved it that's great that's great dan and i have been texting each other uh we texted each other i think the other night about this movie because dan seen dan saw it a a couple weeks ago i think or last week dan or something i saw it last week yeah yeah and um i know dan's a a wes anderson fan uh, through and through so um 
and the more I watched it, the more I was like, I understand now why Dan Bayer loves this movie. But Dan, can you tell everybody why you do love this movie? Yeah, um, huge Wes Anderson fan. Um, also, you know, huge fan of the theater. So the it's like he made this movie specifically what? for me. You the um, theater? No. I, yes, I know. So shocking. Shocking. But um, I when the report, like when the review started coming out of Cannes, and they all started talking about theater, I was like what like what is this movie about <laughs> what the, what are they talking about theater what is this movie what are the trailers hiding you know and i i to circle back to the earlier conversation i think that is part of why this is doing so much better at the box office than french dispatch is that this is maybe an even more esoteric movie than the french dispatch was but they are not marketing that at all. They are not marketing any of the esoteric shit. Whereas French Dispatch was like, this is specifically for the New Yorker crowd. Mm. Yeah. And people that want to see Timothy Chalamet's penis. Fair. Which, yes. Is, um, <laughs> or people who want to see Francis McDormand see. There Timothy are dozens Chalamet's of us. <laughs> A Venn diagram. Doesn't. <laughs> Venn diagram. Well, also, too, I think it does help that in your trailer you you put Tom Hanks in there for your older crowd to come in. Mm-hmm. And, and, oh, absolutely. And, uh, also, this. a perfect addition here. Oh, yes, my yes, God. Yes. The, every, like, okay, so Wes Anderson's casting is always yeah, pretty it's always great. Wonderful. But really, here, I mean, like, the new people to, to this world, Tom Hanks is flawless he yeah. has that deadpan perfect and the way he interacts with the children and with schwartzman who i think schwartzman is maybe giving his best performance like the best performance of his career it is by far the subtlest work he's ever done and honestly to me it was the most moving performance mm-hmm. he's given if not necessarily the funniest but i also laughed a lot scarlett johansson Mm. has never been this in control of her inner star power i it she's she also fits just like a glove into this it's beautiful speaking of beautiful rupert friend oh um, no. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um Maya Hawk fits in so well, like shockingly well. Mm -hmm. I and all of the all of the kids, I say this especially since like the last I know that I saw Sophia Lillis in something recently and blocked it out of my mind because she was terrible in it and she's great (laughs) in this. So uh, thank you, Wes. Um even like in even the people in like the tiniest roles, like Give me a whole movie about Tilda Swinton's incompetent Dr. Hickenlooper. Like, I w- want to see that. <laughs> and Jeffrey Wright. Yeah. Yeah. That, that monologue that he has His at speech. the start of the yeah. little science convention, I... I applauded when it was done because it was so in awe of how fast he was, how in control of the rhythm and cadence. And it was so entertaining and the way he moved and the way Robert Yeaman's camera moved. It, it It's freaking beautiful. And on top of all that, it, it just like with every Wes Anderson movie, it looks gorgeous. But the mm-hmm. way that he has really embraced the sort of diorama style and made everything in this movie look like miniatures, L- like you'd think he used the same design team and cinematography team from Hereditary because it looks like these miniature dioramas every every shot and it's so perfect there's so many little design details that it's just such a rich world and then you have this framing device which i don't love um because i think it just gets 
a little too cutesy by the end. Um, and I think it's try. I, I, for me with Wes Anderson, I find that the simpler that he keeps his storytelling, the better. And with this and Grand Budapest Hotel, the layers upon layers don't seem to quite click as much as they should. Like we're not. So the conceit is that we're watching, you know, a documentary about the making of this play, Asteroid City, at the same time that we're watching it, which you would think would lead to a lot of parallels between the characters that we see and the actors playing them. And there's not really like there there, really there, isn't. there kind of is but it, you really got to work for it and it just i don't think that the amount of work that goes into that framing device and how much energy they put into it as delightful as it is and like if you're anything like me who likes those like old like you know the whatever was Texaco star playhouse or whatever it used to be like way back on TV in the fifties. And where they did things like this, it is as you would expect from Wes Anderson, like a perfect recreation of those things. And in, in every way, the tone and the look and feel of it. But I just feel like it doesn't pay enough dividends for it to be worth it. Especially when the movie is so short and it could have been that length and also spent more time with the people in Asteroid City. And I think that would have been, a, it's easy to see that being a more focused, enjoyable, cohesive film. But that do you think, said- Do you think that might be because of the pacing of each of the acts? Because you've got three acts in yeah. the epilogue and act one is massive. Mm-hmm. Two is there really is short yeah. and three is really short. So the pacing is a little wonky as a result. It is a little wonky, and but then, I, as the more I've thought about this movie over the past week, um, I, I see this, and I see French Dispatch, and I see Grand Budapest Hotel, and I see these movies that are about the time periods and places in which they take place, even more so than they're about the actual story that they're trying to tell and i think the fascinating thing about asteroid city is how it takes 19 takes the 1950s and it looks at the american west and it looks at the east coast new york city the world of new york city theater and it's fascinating how well it captures not only those two places but how the people in those two places thought about each other at that point in time. And once you expand that out, especially with everything that is in this about the quarantine and that can easily be related to the pandemic that we have been living through, it makes a really fertile ground for conversation between the 1950s and the 2020s. And I find that that is really fascinating and I can't wait to see it again with that more in mind it's a lot going on yeah, there's a lot going yeah. on in this movie it's a it's it's like dan said it's kind of sneaky and how much is layered in this zach you did a piece which is up on awardswatch.com of ranking all of wes anderson's films so if you've already read that piece out there which was a great piece Thank you. Uh, then you already know zach's rankings and but he'll get to dabble into why he ranked at least his top five um, but I think I saw that Asteroid City was on the high mark. It was on the in the the I think it was like six, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it was number it was number six. Yeah, number six. Um, <clears throat> which I mean, you know, obviously, like we'll see how it holds up as the years go on. It could go up higher. It could go down lower. Um, my um, first of all, I have to say I'm surprised that of this group, I'm, I'll probably be the first one to bring up Adrian Brody in this movie um i already did it i i fired off that tweet literally (laughs) in my car bitch because i need a moment of privacy because holy shit lives 
were changed. <laughs> it, of the two films that he's made in the past 12 months, uh, where he plays a luminary of 1950s theater and um, the filmmakers <laughs> employ multiple aspect ratios and switch back and forth between color and black and white, I think this is the far superior one. Um, you think? Far <laughs> superior. <laughs> um, Good job, Zach. Good job. Thank you. Um, I've been a Wes Anderson fan basically all of my movie going life. Um, and when I went to film school in 2008, when I was a child, obviously, because I just graduated. You just school. graduated. It was, yeah, yeah. you're a child prodigy. What went to say? film school first and then went back and got my high school diploma. Dang, yeah. As, so, as that, one does. You need that to hold down a job, right? Yeah, exactly. And, um, but um, by that point, he had only made five films and already he was like a person who everybody in my school idolized, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that as his style has become more particular and more controlled, people tend to overlook the emotional content that's still there, right? Um, and I think, you know, um, what you guys are talking about in terms of the framing device, I'll, I'll stick up for it a little bit. And I will admit that when I was watching this for the first time, I was a little bit like, where is this going, right? Like, how is this all going to tie together? And part of the reason I'm excited to watch it again is to delve into more deeply how he, you know, plays with that throughout. Um, But what really got me about the way this story unfolds at the very end, there's a moment where... um, you're watching the, I don't even know how to describe this, like the behind the scenes of the play as it's going on. And Jason Schwartzman's actor character races out and he asks Adrian Brody, who's playing the director, what do I do? I don't know what the play is about. I don't know how to continue on with this. And um, I'll mangle this line, but essentially he says to him, uh, none of us know, but we just keep playing it, right? And that's when it hit me. It's like, oh, that's why he did this, right? The whole, you know, not to spoil the plot of this movie from what people who haven't seen it, but essentially it's like Schwartzman comes to Asteroid City with his children. He hasn't told them that his wife, their mother, has died. Um, he does tell them eventually, still doesn't know how to deal with it. And then an alien drops down from Earth, right? And nobody knows how to deal with that. And it hit me that, you know, in our lives, to lose, you know, to be a father of four young children and lose your wife is as unexplainable a phenomenon as watching an alien come down to Earth. You know, none of us knows how to deal with something like that. Nothing in our lives actually prepares us for how to deal with that. And yet we keep playing the part that is life. Um, And, you know, to that end, I think this framing device, the purpose that it serves is to um interrogate, well, not interrogate, but to just sort of ruminate on the reasons why we go to stories in the first place, right? Um, I remember I had this experience when I read the Book of Atonement right before the movie came out. And in the book, the twist of it is revealed in a very different way. I, it's one of the best things I've ever read. That right? It's so well done, my God. Yeah, the, I, I remember again. Getting- Getting to the final sentence of that book, and I thought, now wait a second. So you're telling me that everything that I just read in the second act was all the construction of an author? Why did I care about this in the first place? And then I realized, yeah, right, that's the whole thing about reading a book or watching a movie or watching a play. Um, none of it's real, right? Um, <laughs> and yet we invest all of our emotions into what's going to happen to these people who do not exist in real life, who are all wearing costumes and are all on fake sets. 
but we invest ourselves in their story because at its core, art is a reflection of life. And I think that's what he's getting at in making, in this kind of weird nesting doll uh, structure that he has, is to say to us, we turn to stories to help us get through the moments in life that we don't otherwise know how to deal with. And he, he even kind of breaks that when Brian Cranston then pops up. Oh, in my God. The movie in the what and he even says, what am I? Am I in this? What am I doing? Uh, am, am I not in it's this? It's such a perfect oh. moment to that, that is just to to your point that just kind of like, what is going on? To just break it up. Yeah. And then I I um I kind of totally forgot about any of the stuff out of can because there's it's been a, like a month and a half and just was like it's a Wes Anderson movie. I'm gonna let it let it take me. <laughs> and I'm gonna float down the river and see how see how I go. And I I love Wes. Uh, I watched his ten features uh, a couple all in the, um uh, like two weeks ago, um and because I w- I was really looking forward to seeing this one and um I was kind of blown away by it. I mean the first I mean the framing device is really early. It's like the first um the first scene of the film or cranston who i think also too very underrated as a a narrator of this and essentially and i am not going to take credit for this but a a good friend of ours cody derrick's kind of kind of mentioned this on his letterbox review talking about how this is wes anderson's uh, our town and i thought and i thought that that was just a wonderful comparison um but then but then as the movie was going on in those first couple five minutes, I was I was already confused and trying to figure out what was going on, and I was I was you know uh, I was like, where are we going, Wes? And then that the that needle drop of you know last train to San Fernando and and that um, miniature of the train and the the way that the credits start rolling, I I had the biggest smile on my face that I've had at a movie in like months. Maybe the last time I had a smile on my face like that was when I was sitting next to Dan during John Wick uh, at South Park <laughs> because, like, I was just like, "Oh my God, look at it! It's it's the power of movies with a and and a concern for uh, budget and what you can do with said budget. You don't have to have two hundred million dollar movies because I've been seeing a lot of two hundred million dollar movies the last three weeks at screenings and whatnot, and they look like shit." And then you see a Wes Anderson film, and this is it, this is the number one complaint I hate from people online that get to see a Wes Anderson movie ahead of time, because their tweets are all the same. It's the it's the most Wes Anderson Wes Anderson movie of all time, derp de derp. I've never seen a more Wes Anderson movie than Wes Anderson's ever created here, and it's the stupidest tweets because like. You're all mentioning, okay, but what do you think about it? What do we? Let's but not it takes out. Other but it, what I'm saying is like Dang. it takes. Shut up, Eric. I didn't speak over you when you were talking. Uh, um, it it takes gonna, it yeah. takes away what Zach's talking about, which is the uh, the real depths of emotionality that he's able to find here, and it takes away from the wonderful performances, the beautiful cinematography, the production design, which is just out of bounds, insane. Uh, it it's this that attention to detail you don't get from many people anymore, and. I thought that as much as you guys are, are talking about that this really done by the trailer, you don't get that this is going to be his ode to um to film, his ode to um his ode to actors, his ode to writing, because the French dispatch is that of writers that have influenced him. And in a lot of and Spielberg and, and uh, oh, and this movie is that what you're saying, Spielberg? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I agree with that. But then I also was thinking about a lot about the Edward Norton character and the way he looks and the way how he sounds and everything. And it was almost as if it was Wes's relationship that he has with the cavalcade of characters and actors that he has produced or worked with over his entire eleven filmography, and then yet still. The ones that work the best, I think, in the film are and the ones that are most comfortable are the ones that he's worked with. But then it's the new additions that come in here and he's able to work with that are absolutely surprising as well. I think Hanks is the best he's been in years. You mentioned Scarlett Johansson. She's 
incredible. This is her second go around. She was just a voice actor in Isle of Dogs. So this is really her first time in live action. And then Schwartzman, probably his best performance since working with with uh, Wes Anderson since Rushmore. I mean, just truly the and then sort of the the depths of how I've I've been thinking about a lot of the similarities between Bill Murray's character in that film and that sort of aimlessness and loneliness that that character has. You mix in with with Schwartzman's character here, um, and then there's sort of a romance that that kindles there. the The greatest thing that that Wes Anderson's done in the last two movies is start working with Jeffrey Wright, who is absolutely incredible again in this movie. Um, I mean, yes. Then you get like the 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 mini you know moments with Willem Dafoe and Adrian Brody, who is a snack, and uh, Jeff Goldblum, and um, you know, I think even and Leah Shriver, who is is, is great hilarious he's and, really really funny Carell too Carell's really hilarious. great in this um Which was bill murray's part yeah that was, and, that oh, was originally bill murray yeah and then he got because you would think that it would be the tom hanks role that was That's, originally meant for bill murray say, yeah. no totally isn't that wild yeah. and then hope but, davis also, i thought making really ed norton and schwartzman gay together thank you loved thank it you. <laughs> it really i I think it was like Joe Reed who said this on Letterbox that like it's really a real trip watching Wes Anderson discover gay people over the past <laughs> couple movies. Like, yeah, <laughs> it was giving a little bit of like Disney's first gay character, but when, yes, <laughs> but like actually, but I liked it. But also too, it like thinking about the the sort of like almost meta commentary about the, the fact that Edward Norton's almost playing like a version of Wes Anderson, and of course he would have a a sex scene with Jason Schwartzman. So there was a little bit of like, I was kind of laughing at the, I, I was kind of laughing and winking at that. I was like, Oh, the first muse, you know what I mean? Outside of, well, I, I, sort Wilson of in um, this. I, I sort of uh, took him as being a, a send up of um, Tennessee Williams. Yeah. That's, that's what too. I saw like, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, so definitely that, but... With that accent and just the, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the, 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 uh, the uh, mustache and all that. Yeah. And, um, yeah. But overall, With a little bit I mean, of John Waters, <laughs> you know, yeah. John Waters too. Um, but overall, I just thought it, I, I, I mean, I've been thinking about this movie the last like two days, and, and, and just everything about it. It's it's wonderful. I mean, there's also uh, an original song done by the the kids in the movie that is absolutely that just little incredible, or whatever that little the- fucking kid. Oh my god, <laughs> hilarious! So I- good. I haven't laughed that hard in the theater in so long at that oh, song. Also, too, and he gets right to it in those opening credits, how much it looks like Looney Tunes, and then there's mm-hmm. a goddamn yeah, the road runner, runner at the he end. beeps through the whole damn movie. Oh, yeah. my God. I'm like, where's the coyote? Every time the road runner <laughs> There's a reference up, started to laughing. him. <laughs> but Getting also flattened by the bus, but that, oh, my God, the Looney Tunes of it all. Also thought Tilda was great too, and she's in in, in a couple of scenes. This is like I think the most Tilda's had to do in a long time in his movies because she's really. If you watch like Grand Budapest, she's dead in like the first twenty minutes, and then if you watch like Moonrise, she's like there for like two scenes, and she's on the phone. So uh, it was nice to see her get more involved and uh, in, in everything. I will and, watch her show up to just read the phone. I know. So, I mean, truly, you know, honestly, I don't. I mean, yes, you guys mentioned Rupert Friend, mine Hawk, who's who's fantastic in this as well. I, I just like they're. You know, I would say the one thing about the French Dispatch, um, which is a movie we may or may not talk about in our top fives here, um, that's there's so many people in that damn movie that some people do get a little bit wasted in it. Um, I don't think a single person is is wasted in this movie, and it's you know who's not of- wasted and absolutely perfect, mm. Margot Robbie. Mm. Her one scene for me was like some of her best work in a while because it's the least margot robbie for me but yeah i'm imagining very um, straightforward true but she still had that that. accent so no it was not there it was oh it was there it was not babylon i tanya there it was Uh, it was Mm, very close close. totally disagree that is her default now that's all right it was just you know it was very um disorienting to hear her talking in that voice and her uh queen elizabeth the first garb um that yeah, was that that great like that mary queen of scots, scots hair yeah. that was <laughs> that i did tell dan was, where's the consumption mm-hmm. i did tell dan that i love that scene and i love everything about it just the, what it says for schwartzman what it says for the character and it says for this family and everything it's, it's so a, beautifully it's written. so 
beautifully written. Yeah. But Margot does take it take me out of it. And then I was talking to Dan about it and I was like, man, if that was like Carrie Coon, that scene would have been like a top five all time Wes Anderson scene for me because it, it's Carrie Coon and she's great in everything. And there's never, so as I said, you can't move. just dangle the prospect of Carrie Coon <laughs> in a Wes Anderson film in front of me like that. Ryan McQuaid. Well, it's a movie about stage actors. And I thought of the first one that's like, stage actor and you know married to a playwright and and, as soon as he said that i'm like there is a universe where she is in that movie but not just is she in that part tracy letts is in the tom hanks role and you know what i'd have to think very long and hard about whether i'd prefer to be in that universe or this one does that mean that tracy would be really good in in this does that mean that tracy letts is carrie coon's daddy in that in that situation then well see now well Uh, i'm just he said it i'm just yeah, we've I'm been just saying semantics a and happy pride, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I just that was the one, and it's you know, I, it's, I love her. I think, I, I love think her, it's actually, definitely yeah. her best thing that she's done in a long time. I will give you that, Eric. See, I Babylon? think she's terrible in Babylon. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, interesting. Yes, um, but uh, no, I just I, I thought the whole the film at large yes i do agree with eric i think the like the second and the third act could have been a little bit longer maybe you know maybe like five minutes a piece but that's the beauty of wes anderson i will say is he has these great world setups i think the the emotions sort of sneak in underneath and the movies are under two hours like every one of his movies are under two hours they are the perfect vessel for every audience to go see something because like if you think it gets too much well you can't say it was like it was a three-hour experience i couldn't get out of there it was like no it, th- this is an hour 45 it's like hour 30 hour 45 is a sweet spot and and it always it always works out um but yeah i mean his ode to writers in the last one now is kind of ode to actors it's it's he's getting sentimental about his craft and i do agree with dan i think there was a little bit of of covetness and in, in this you know but he's also been working this entire time and uh, it's that great sentimentality that he has that i think he carries a lot in his animated films, and I think he's been carrying that for the last two live action films. So, um, yeah, I, think I he's really, really of, like this movie. I think he's hitting this this stride where I, I think a lot of times his, his films are regarded as twee or a little distant or a little cold just for the sake of aesthetic mm-hmm. and not and, and sometimes lacking in connective emotion. Mm-hmm. And I think that might be. I don't know, obviously, reality. Maybe that is sort of him as a person, and this is how he gets that across. But I do think that recently that facade is breaking a little bit, and it certainly is in the movie. So the the bits of emotion that are in there are strained because the characters are straining to get there. Mm-hmm. And I think that's such a great kind of trajectory for him. Or mm-hmm. movies. I mean, Hanks and Schwartzman both have emotional scenes that they they each have to kind of really reach to get there, not as actors, but as the characters. Mm-hmm. So I, I just love that. I feel it more. And And I hope that people who are finding that true about this movie in particular go back and watch his earlier movies. Like go back and watch the Royal Tenenbaums, which Uh is super emotional or even Darjeeling, which is probably close to the bottom. If I was ranking all of his movies, but like Mm -hmm. there's some real emotional depth working in that movie. And, you know, and Moonrise Kingdom too, obviously. I mean, I hope that people see that because it it has always been there. I would even say in something like Isle of Dogs is another movie that like if you rewatch that movie, there is there's a lot of emotionality by the end of that movie that that kind of subtly sneaks up by the last 15 minutes of that movie. Anyway, Zach, you were going to say something. Oh, I was going to say, I mean, like you, Ryan, I rewatched all of um, the films um, in preparation for this one. Um, I mean, I've seen them multiple, multiple times, even the ones that would rank towards the bottom i basically he's never made a movie that i haven't you know loved you know even yeah. like his you know the one i would put at the bottom um <clears throat> but i think you can divide wes anderson's career into two halves and maybe this is the start of the third one 
but I think like the first half of his career, he was angsty, you yeah. know, because he was a young man working out a lot of different things, you know. So like Bottle Rocket, Rushmore, Royal Tenenbaums, Life Aquatic, Darjeeling Limited all have this kind of like, you know, on their sleeve emotionality to them. And I think that post Fantastic Mr. Fox going into Moonrise, going into Grand Budapest and um, Isle of Dogs and French Dispatch, the motion's still there. He's just dealing with it in a much more um, deadpan sort of way. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if it's like just his mat maturation as a person that did that, or if it was his increasing perfectionism as a visual artist. Um, but I think that this one um, really gets at something, and he's talked about what his next film is going to be, which is going to be a, mm -hmm. a father-daughter film. Mm -hmm. um, he is a relatively new father. Um, I think his child's about seven or so. I don't know. Um, I don't know Wes Anderson personally, so I have no. He's a very pri he is a very private guy, to be fair. So yeah, yeah. what I found out on the internet, let's say, um, when he got out of his antique clock to come make these movies, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And um, but yeah, it's I I think there's you know, and this is true of any great filmmaker, right? You go through different stages of your life, yeah, and that's reflected in the films that you make, yeah. Um. I mean, I think like, when, when anyone ever asks, like, you know, what movie should I start? If I'm going to start with a director, I'm like, start at the beginning. Yeah. Watch, yeah. Watch things chronologically. Just, so you can see their evolution as a person yeah. and a filmmaker. <laughs> Just do it like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree. I mean, I agree with you when I was watching him, Zach. I felt that I felt those eras, too. I felt that that sort of anxiousness. I felt that 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 that, you know, almost like like a like a punk rockish sort of vibe to those early films that he has those rebel films that he has with Rushmore and Royal Tenenbaums even and then it starts you know Darjeeling and in Life Aquatic they're 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 I would call them their le his lesser films and, and and not to say that they're bad but and they have moments of genuine uh, of genuine you know emotion and 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 still wonderment but they're they're a little aimless still and then I think I think the stop motion was the best thing for him because that's such a meticulous form yeah, sure. and he's able to hone in on everything and he has to be super uber specific. And so I think that the bookend of that second part are those animated films, you know, of going from, from fantastic all the way to Isle of Dogs. And now it's these, it's, I have the ability to have these giant ensembles, but I'm telling more um, like the, like Dan's mission, the setting is, is a, is a character here, but then the subject matter of these films, like writing and plays and actors for Asteroid City. And then of course, you know, the, this, these cavalcade of writers and these stories that they're telling in the French dispatch, they're, they're the main characters of this and everybody inhabiting in these bodies are, are really just the, the, the players, you know, trying to, to, you know, say the message behind all of it. And I think that a lot of people have kind of felt with these last two films, like there's a, there's a little bit of a disconnect because it's a new, I think, style in which he's trying to tell his films and a new way he's trying to deliver his message. And I think that the thing about French Dispatch, and I think that it's going to be the same thing as we've all mentioned with Asteroid City, is they're going to start demanding you because of the meticulousness of not just his vision, but also his script. You're going to have to go back and you're going to have to see these things multiple times. And I, it's not as straightforward and I and I agree with Dan. I love his straightforward approach to a lot of his films, but that's what then the maturity of him as a as a writer and as a director is. Is that you know I'm trying to tell you a lot, and and yet I still think it's controlled enough where it's still able to you're still able to have a, a cohesion of of understanding of this is an actual message that's behind it rather than just like, it's a bunch of aimless points. Like, it's not like he's making fucking tenant or anything. It's like, don't just feel it or whatever. You know what I mean? It's like, he's making things that I, I think that. Well, I mean, he does kind of sense. say that in this. He movie. does. He's like, like yeah, yeah, does, like, yeah. No, we don't yeah. really know why he burns his hand <laughs> on the show. Just do it. 
just do it. But um, but no, I, I it, think sometimes too, when 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 writers and and writer directors write something about writing, mm-hmm. it can go a lot of ways. It can mm-hmm. either just you know make fun of it too much or feel like a snake eating its tail. And mm-hmm. I I think I think Anderson subverts a lot of that because he's he kind of does all of it a little bit. Mm-hmm. He's a little bit making fun of of it. Um, but not to the point of it being, I don't know, off-putting in any way. Yeah. It just, I, it's not a lesson. It's not, uh, here, here is the behind the scenes drama of what it takes to, to write. It's, it's not trying to do really kind of any of that, which is really successful for me. Yeah. No. And I think, I think the best thing about Wes as a, as a screenwriter and a storyteller is his is his his ability to collab with other writers. I mean, he did that early with with Owen Wilson. Schwartzman has been a collaborate uh, collaborator. Um, obviously, Roman Coppola is is somebody that really worked with him. But this screenplay, Coppola has the story credit, but it's it's all West behind behind the script for this one. And I found that that to be really interesting when the when the 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 title card started rolling at the beginning because I was like, oh, he just he just went all out with this one. Oh, okay, this is. Um, and I mean, it has those attention to detail. It has all those miniatures that I love so much and the costumes are out of control and, and, and the cinematography is amazing. And the movie is, yes, everything's in the center and you had to have to adjust within like the first two minutes because it, it not everything. Look like, there's, you know, there's, there's, yeah, the there's lots framing of, of like the waitress with the menu and I, there's, yeah. there's, there's all kinds of stuff. Well, she's not in the center, but in, in the bathtub. Oh my yeah. God. But you know. Well, the cam- or still camera mostly, at least you know he's he's not doing a lot of swoops and whatnot in his films. But all, overall, um, I I I think we all are very positive on this film, and uh, maybe we'll be talking about it next week when we're talking about best films of the year so far. Um, but we are going to move on and talk about our top five Wes Anderson films of all time. Maybe Asteroid City is in somebody's five. You never know. Um, if you never listen to a top five here on the awards watch podcast, it's just simple. Uh, we, we go one at a time, you know, five all the way to one. If somebody has mentioned a film then we talk about it all at once at that same time, um, just for, you know, not repeating ourselves or also just to make sure this show runs smoothly. So we're going to go Dan, Zach, Eric, and then myself. So yeah, I know Dan, Dan gave me the face already of like, Oh great. I got to go first. Um, so Dan, your number five Wes Anderson film. My number five Wes Anderson film is uh one that I a lot of people have closer to the top of their list than I do, um, which is the Grand Budapest Hotel, okay. um, which I find delightful as a piece of design. And kind of incredible as a screwball comedy and homage to the 1930s styles of filmmaking. Um, Much like, a little bit like Asteroid City, I think it kind of collapses a bit under the weight of its many different timelines and stories and modes of storytelling. But it's so much fun and so funny and just like a feast for the eyes mm-hmm. one of alexander desplat's best scores i think mm-hmm. generally speaking he does a lot of his best work with wes anderson i think wes anderson brings out something special in him yep um and i ray fines is giving maybe the single best performance in any Wes Anderson movie in this movie. And there's one, I think that really challenges it that I'll, I'll get to later on my mm-hmm. list, but it, he is a chef's kiss perfection and the movie is impeccable, but I don't quite love it as much as the other ones, but it's so much fun. Yeah. Zach, where do you have it on your list? I know it's on your list. Uh, it's actually my number three. So um, you're right, Dan. Um, and I will say that like um, I had gone back and forth on this movie for a while because uh, I sort of had the same um, mindset that you did for a while that I thought that it was just kind of, you know, pretty to look at, but it didn't quite hit me. Um, but 
you know, I kept returning to it over the years as I have every other Wes Anderson film. And it's continued to grow on me. And <clears throat> on this rewatch in particular, I was just struck by how beautiful every single image in this movie is and how deliberate the decisions about color and lighting and framing are. And I was also like you, I, I just, of all the nominations this movie got, the fact that one was not for Ray Fiennes in Best Actor, <laughs> the rightful winner that year, as far as I'm concerned. Truly. Um, <laughs> he's so good at both being charming and melancholy at the same time, which is sort of the Wes Anderson aesthetic. And I would love to see the two of them work together again, because I think that he brings out the best in Ray Fiennes' persona. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just, um, ask me on any other day and I could rearrange any of the top five. It, it's truly difficult for me. Mm -hmm. But as of this recording and as of what I've published at awardswatch.com. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Where it will live forever so you can never change it We're again. never Zach. changing it ever again. <laughs> um, Oh yeah, my. it's it, it's my number three, and it would have been my uh, of the nominated films that year. My uh, pick for best picture. Oh, okay, interesting. Dan, would you would you have said the same thing? Uh, no. Okay, okay. All right. that's <laughs> that's fair. Eric, as much Eric, as I enjoyed it that year, no. no. Okay, um, Eric, do you have it on your list? It is also my number three. Um, I'm rather unintentionally i think zach and my list are going to be very 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 close <laughs> uh no it is my number three it's wild that this was the movie that was his big oscar breakthrough and his biggest box office hit too this is like the biggest movie of his career it's when it all collided it this yeah. Yeah. and i love that i love when a director like this you know, kind of builds this this brand. And I don't say that in a content kind of way, but I mean, just as a persona and style and all that. And then is able to cross that threshold, both critically, uh, financially, and with awards, while not for a moment sacrificing anything about the style and, and uh, and content that they that they have yeah. uh i love this i think this is yeah ray fine's best performance ever Ooh. um i do think it's his best sorry schindler's list mm -hmm. um i think it is his best um i think You're going to burn like a marshmallow for saying that eric <laughs> Well, wow. crazy me on that. Give me on that s'more too, because I agree with you. Yes, no, good. I, I, no, I mean, he's obviously fantastic in in terms of. Um, I just think this gives him a whole lot more to work with. Yeah. Um, I think Tony Revolori is wonderful too. Again, such uncanny ability by Anderson mm -hmm. to find fantastic young actors. It's. Yeah um yeah i i love this movie it's, it's beautiful. it is are you ready for it my number three as well the grand budapest what? hotel y'all so um, just read zach's listing <laughs> and let it influence you where is the independent thought going on um, here <laughs> I, I i i love this movie um it's one of four wes anderson films that i have as five stars on letterbox um and this last viewing really really just solidified the five star ranking for it. And one, the movie is absolutely hilarious. I think that we kind of undersold how funny and sort of slapsticky and very mm -hmm. um, much at times, a lot of the humor feels very much of, of classic Hollywood. And, and, and it was, I felt a lot of Buster Keaton vibes a lot throughout it, especially the physical comedy. And then also just then the over the topness then of, of, of some of the jokes too, like, the boy with apple pity can get replaced by two women scissoring them, you know, or or the the way that the the animals are dying, or the way that Willem Dafoe gets pushed over the cliff and stuff like that, like shit like that is absolutely hilarious. 
And it's like this, you know, like, oh, if I'm going to die. And then Tony Revolori pushes him over and goes, holy shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, like, it's it's great. I love the the world building within it, too, of, like, it's almost like the the society of, what, of Secret Keys or something that it is um, with the with the, the different concierge. And yeah. um, and I think that the complexities of Mr. Gustav and and how that this is a man that is giving a lot of pleasure to to people. Um, but not just the old women, but to everybody at the hotel. But yet, there's a very the, under on the surface of all of it. There, this is bubbling over is this this real sense of loneliness, this real sense of melancholy that I, I think that is what makes Fine's performance so great. Wouldn't be my personal favorite actor if if uh, if he was nominated because I would I would have probably given it to like Oscar Isaac for Inside Lewin Davis that year if that was a nomination that could have happened. But uh, obviously, obviously before, I would have given uh, mine to Jake Gyllenhaal. But like the non-nominated actors that year, yeah, we could have get rid of the yeah, whole lineup, yeah, God. literally, and the just start a stretch. Yeah, um, but I, 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 I agree. Tony Revolori is great. Uh, Sersha in her small part, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a really, really great film, and it almost really gives me a sweet tooth because you see the Mendel's um, desserts in the film and they just, and I'm like, <laughs> so Shit, I really want something <laughs> like that right yeah. now. Good um, food movie. Very yes. good. And, but I want to, I do, I do really want to shout out. I think the, the thing that really makes the film so fantastic is no, no pun intended to another movie title is the scenes with Jude law and F Murray Abraham, which I think are, wonderful narration devices but then also i love the production design of we see the grand budapest at its heyday but then we see what it becomes later in that film and there's a different kind of mystique and beauty to it that i find to be really fascinating um very great gardens yeah very much so um (laughs) but i I love it that wes anderson sadness comes in yeah Mm -hmm. lurking underneath everything is the is the rise of fascism in europe yeah and how all of this elegance is going to go away very quickly. Well, also you know? how Zero is going to have a very sad life because he mm-hmm. loses Agatha, and then he also loses Gustav, and all he has left is this painting in a hotel. Yeah, and it's really a sad story by the end of it. And you're all along for this hilarious ride with this wonderful cast, but it, at the end of it, there is the the loneliness. And it's it's almost full circle. And I think Jeff it's Goldblum with his mustache and that cat that gets thrown out the window. We <laughs> the just cat. love to see. I don't want to talk see. about that. <laughs> the cat. That's Dan oh, his, fifth. His poor and... pussy. His poor pussy. <laughs> oh my god. That's Dan's number five, and Zach, Eric, and myself's number three, and that's the Grand Budapest Hotel. Zach, you're number five. My number five <clears throat> is Moonrise Kingdom, and. This was another film that moved up my ranking on a rewatch. Um, you know, there was a time where being a Wes Anderson fan was a little fraught because after Life Aquatic <laughs> and Darjeeling Limited, people thought, well, he's kind of lost his way. I've seen those movies multiple times. So, you know, even his lesser films, I still find highly enjoyable. Um, when Moonrise Kingdom came out, um, it felt like a comeback though because um even though his style had become even more particular and even more controlled there was this really sweet and touching love story at the center of it um i i've seen very few films about adolescence burgeoning adolescence that feel this honest in this accurate and you know, you feel as though um, this had to have been adapted from some kind of young adult novel, you know, that like somebody like Judy Bloom had written um, (laughs) because it's that carefully observed. Um, I I love the world that he creates in this film. Um, I love the cast of characters that he populates it with. Um, I love that he like, get some of the best work out of Bruce Willis that has ever right? been done. And, you know, would not like, have been mad at an Oscar nomination. Mm-mm. I mean, same, I same. Like, he deserved it. And it was just, um, Wes Anderson has this uncanny ability, like he had with Bill Murray in Rushmore, to 
sense something lurking underneath a star's persona mm -hmm. that's been there all the time, but just has not been brought yeah. out because they didn't have the right director yet. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just, I love Alexander Desplat's score. Um, I love the cinematography. Um, I just, yeah. What again, more can I say? Again, great finding of kid actors. I mean, the yes, two in, yeah. the, in the lead, but then also Lucas Hedges. Yeah, is, maybe is, Lucas Hedges before yeah. his voice had changed. <laughs> <laughs> and everything. Um, <laughs> does anybody else have this on their list, Dan, Eric? It's probably six. Okay. It's, it's, my... def it's definitely six. <laughs> it's my number one. Oh! Uh, Moonrise Kingdom is a perfect movie. It is, I think, setting it in not just like with these characters having it be this like sort of pre-teen tween age romance that kind of feels like a older children's novel but not quite YA is sort of the perfect milieu for Wes Anderson to do what he does mm -hmm. and because it is that perfect combination of deadpan and sweet that sweet and almost sour that it just blossoms uh jared gilman and kara hayward are absolutely perfect and you're like they really like he is the best director of children i think working today it that he what he's able to get out of them and i think part of it is because he is so precise by nature but he's able to get these magic things out of it and there are so many frames of this that just live rent free in my head forever it is maybe alexander desplat's best score um it mind-boggling and i love the use of um the what like the big classical music piece that they use it at the britain piece fucking perfect um and yeah i it, it is to me just like the everything that is good about his style done to the most perfection that it has ever been done and i love it so much it's immaculate and yet it gets me right in the feels every time i love every single one of those uh, children's book covers i would read them in a heartbeat uh, and i just i absolutely adore it and also like just the idea of casting tilda swinton as social services social services social <laughs> hey, services i love that that's line her character she's it's... not a person she's a goddamn institution okay <laughs> i just love it when they're flying her in and it's bumpy they're like hang on social <laughs> services it's one yeah. of my favorite lines of that movie um no Crazy. she she's great I, I i love francis um that scene where she's um with her daughter in the bathtub i, I think that that's beautiful. such a you know a beautiful scene i think of also the boat scene with with um with bruce willis and they're you know it, that's a great scene i think of the the marriage scene the sort of slow motion that you know that happens ah. after and sort of marries them that's great um you know i i think Ed bob Abelba is perfect bob Abelbon is the narrator bob. who also gets like injected into the story at times too is and, the, and like the part where they're all yelling at each other you guys remember last summer when i taught him how to do this that'll help you with this clue to keep you going forward it's really <laughs> funny and it's so good it, it's a it, it did move down a little bit a <laughs> little bit for me um on my on my rankings it's it's seven but it's a strong seven um for me i i yeah i know dan um but um but i i, I have um strong affection for it and i have a strong affection for all these movies so apparently not strong enough for me to talk well you like know what well, maybe it'll be a little bit better i'm just what i'm right. saying i know you think it's the best <laughs> one but it's not um but anyway no uh that's dan's number one that's zach's number five and that's moonrise kingdom eric what's your number five um i i don't know if it's the newness factor uh but uh asteroids Teddy is my number five. And okay. that was going back and forth between is it Moonrise or is it Asteroid City? Um, because I I I love silly and melancholic, you know, preteen romance stories. They're fun and and it, 
Moonrise is, is fantastic. Uh, but I just like like we discussed earlier, I think this asteroid is just such a fantastic maturation and point in Anderson's career where even though he's always successful at combining tragedy and comedy, I don't know. I I just felt I felt that that there's that there's like some t- type of zenith with Asteroid City. And mm-hmm. and I didn't get lost in how many people were in this. And <laughs> if they only had one scene, which was totally fine because it it's it now feels less like a gimmick uh yeah. when we get those a lot when we get a lot of cameos that are just for the sake of a cameo because nothing ever feels like that they just feel because he works with the same people the same people so many times whether it's as a lead or as a single scene just wants to work with them it, it feels like you are watching like summer stock and the roles just keep moving yeah. around. It's just a company, yeah. Of it's characters. a company, exactly. And it's I, him I, and Christopher Guest. They just work at this. Work, keep working with the same people. I don't care. I love yeah. it. Love it. Um, yeah. And I, I, we didn't talk that much about Scarlett Johansson, but I, I think she is so exceptional here. She's kind of she's. You know, through the various little uh, scenes and uh, and sections, she's channeling a little bit of Tuesday Weld or Kim Novak mm. and also Judy Garland and then also Marilyn Monroe and mm-hmm. saying that fake out with the bathtub. I'm telling you seriously. Yeah. That got me good. That got me good. Yeah, <laughs> that is what she's doing is really, really, really difficult. Because it it can feel just like a copycat, and at no point does it ever ever feel that yeah. way. I feel like I'm watching Scarlett Johansson, and like mm-hmm. maybe the most Scarlett Johansson that I've ever seen. Yeah. I feel like I'm watching her. Yeah, yeah. I, I I don't know. I was just exceptionally moved by her, and yeah. super impressed. I just thought that her it and Schwartzman her together were just. I mean that it. it it was so beautiful and it, and they're all and and then i think of the scene at the towards the end of the film where Schwartzman goes back in the to that to that window in the face that he has when she's not there anymore it's, it's mm-hmm. devastating it's just yeah it's great yeah, yeah. Dan, you the, the, the um it's incredible to me that in the world of wes anderson which is maybe the most manicured and um, you know, art, art, artificial is not the right word, but like very regimented and predetermined, I guess, of like any major director winning today. She manages to turn in like her most natural feeling performance since Lost in Translation. Absolutely. I, I, I don't know how she did it. I yeah. don't know. She played I an alien she, pretty good. And the, that, <laughs> char- that character. <laughs> is stacked against her to do that too. Yeah. Yeah. Um so yeah. Yeah. I I love too that the graphic nudity is her, but it's really not her. It's great. Yeah. It's so good. <laughs> and because right as soon as they as they show it, they talk about body doubles and stunt doubles. It's so good. <laughs> it's fucking hilarious. It's great. Yeah. Also, too, we didn't mention this when we were talking about it in the review, but I, I did want to give a shout out to another performance, one scene. But I was like, if this is her audition to then come back into this universe, Hong Chow is so good. Yes. In her one scene that she's in, it was so effortless. I was like, my God, why isn't she the lead of this movie? Make a whole movie with her, Wes, please. But then that's also just Hong Chow. She's just great and everything. But I thought mm-hmm. she had great chemistry with Adrian Brody uh, in that white yes. t shirt. So, that white the, t-shirt had the chemistry with adrian brody <laughs> <laughs> i'm telling you yamahama all right we're gonna move on. the most physically fit director <laughs> who's ever lived it's just yeah, <laughs> yeah. all right yeah, um, at it. anybody nobody else had it in their in their top uh, i think i said it was my number six and you know i mean obviously it could move up but it's competing with a lot of movies that i love so yeah it's my number four 
Oh, okay. okay. All right, Ooh. damn. And it was very. It, I I went back and forth between putting it at number five and number four, but all overall, I think it holds together better than Grand Budapest does for me. And I could easily actually see it moving up with more time and more rewatches. Yeah, I can't mm-hmm. wait to see it again. Yeah. yeah, same, same for sure. All right. Well, my number five um, is Wes Anderson's tenth feature, and that's The French Dispatch. Um, this was a movie that I I had to I watched um, at a, uh, my first film festival back from the pandemic, and I just saw Come On Come On, and then I saw this afterwards, and I was I was kind of um, a mess by the end of this one because it kind of snuck up on me. I mean, uh, it's the, his giant homage to to writers and the written word, and I just thought that like to be a writer sitting in a room watching a movie about writing and, and our influences and some of the greatest writers of all time and what that means to one of our great screenwriters of, of the modern era. And um, I just think it's, it, it's a movie that's, you know, I, I really don't like anthology movies and, and anthology shows, to be honest with you. Um, but this one really worked for me. And I th- just think it's the, it's the power to his, meticulousness i think you know starting off with angelica houston's narration at the beginning of it and um having bill murray just kind of you know in the film as like the steady point of of an editor and and uh, but then to follow the the lives of these these uh, or the stories of these four writers played by owen wilson and tilda swinton uh and uh, and francis mcdormand and then jeffrey wright i thought it was kind of great because it's like you get a little bit of owen wilson you then get a lot of Tilda Swin, but then that's in company with this incredible sequence with Belisimo del Toro and, and Adrian Brody and Leia Seydu, who's incredible in that movie. And then the, you know, I know that people shit all over the Chalamet sequence, but it's actually grown as uh, over the, 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 as the years have gone on and, and, um, and rewatching that. And I actually think it's, it is the lesser one for me, but it's, it's still really good. And then you, of course, I think the movie's final act, the Jeffrey Wright sequence is, I mean, it's perfect Wes Anderson. I mean, you have, you have stop motion animation, you have a heist, you have a kidnapping, you have uh, food involved, you have um, this, this story within a story, um, you have then, of course, uh, this is a sequence that is, is a great homage to the great James Baldwin um, and Roebuck Wright is played by uh, Jeffrey Wright, and he is incredible. I think of the, the the even the section that sort of stops the story in the middle about how he came to the French Dispatch. Um, I think that the, it that's an incredibly written sequence, and I think if for my money, if anyone should have been nominated from that cast, it should have been Jeffrey Wright. I yep. thought he was extraordinary, and it was like a, just a great marriage to find. Um, and so. Yeah, it's a movie that has grown, and for me over the three or four times that I've watched it, and uh, I absolutely love it. And then also too, it's got like a weird Elizabeth Moss for like a couple of seconds, and then it's got you know, it's got I've heard more Wes Anderson movies. Henry please. Winkler in there for a couple of seconds, yes. and it's got Sir Ronan in there for a couple of seconds, and it's got, Sir Sharonin you know, is a French horror. I mean, for five I mean, seconds, you gotta love it. Gotta love it, but um. Yeah, it's it's one that weirdly I get I've cried every single time I watched it, and I don't and I can't explain it. I wouldn't have thought it going into it, but it's the it's the big surprise on my list. So it's my number five. Anybody got it on their list? This will sound horrible, but it's my eight out of eleven. And mm. yeah, but I mean, makes... having said that, like I'm with still, you. It still made my top ten of the year that it came yeah. out and was nominated for several Lazio awards, <laughs> including. <laughs> Including best picture and best support. I feel like the Lazies are like right. like golden gavels or something. <laughs> <laughs> Illustrious lion. I, 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 it oh. feels like the Golden Globes are going to be up for sale soon. So I'm going like, <laughs> to yeah. buy the GG trademark and call there it the Golden go. Gavels Awards. After, after, you, after you hand them out, it goes boom, boom. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> law and order. It's great. Um, um, but I actually, I mean, I, I uh, in all seriousness, like I did when I saw this movie for the first time, the rap on it was kind of bad. Yeah. yeah. And I was, I, I remember watching it and saying, I think that it is abhorrent 
for people to just dismiss this out of hand because mm -hmm. there's still so much going on and it has <laughs> improved on rewatches as well. I, I might need to do a rewatch because you my should. feelings about it are the things that, that Ryan, that, that you're loving about it are things that I don't love about it. Hmm. I think it is overstuffed too many things and it's the opposite of what I was my feelings about Asteroid City are where I think it has feels like it has less control over that and also about what it has to say about writing it feels like too written I don't I don't know it's not it's, I will say I will say it, Eric it, it doesn't work for me the way that 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 Asteroid did but I you know I I would always revisit it because I don't dislike any of his films yeah, I will say it did take me multiple times to get to this point. It was not one like it wasn't immediate, but it got me emotionally just because of the of the right sequence. But then over time, the other sequences yeah, have I grown. Yeah, I think right is great. Yeah, I just think you it's know, great. there's too. I think it's overstuffed. Yeah, but it gets. But I'm I'm telling you, like that third time or fourth. No, the fourth time I watched it, which was just recently, I was I was sitting there. I was like, man, this just this just works. This, okay, I, I, but if it takes you four times for that yeah. to happen, what's going on there? Because I was curious every time going back to it, why I was, I by the end I was getting that emotional connection, and and I was like I I and I was like it's not, and then also too I hadn't watched all of his other films, and I think by the end when I got to the final, which was this was the tenth one before Asteroid, I was like, yeah, I like that a little bit better than some other stuff, and it was a surprise for me on that point then too so i think when you watch it i you know i know some people are like if you watch it in succession that might be a little sensory overload of a lot of like Art Wes anderson stuff but actually found like you could start pairing things together and mm -hmm. in different films together and yeah. and it kind of works and you don't and i'm not, I'm not for, no one's forcing you to watch 10 films in a row but uh but i had a fun time doing it so <laughs> Um, yeah, I also like French Dispatch a lot more than I think people did or with it, that yeah. first wave of reviews. It'd probably be my number like six or seven yeah. um, because I, I, I agree with Eric. It does kind of feel overstuffed, but also this is a Wes Anderson movie that makes several Jacques Tati references, so mm -hmm. I cannot hate it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and, sure. and, I, and also Tilda Swinton in that wig and those teeth and that dress so you know it <laughs> that, that covers like I, 19 <laughs> tilda swinton movies and I know, I know. The line right there <laughs> like she is just so perfectly that character that i can't like it so uh, good again and i also thought that that was one of i it's so like stereotypically french but i love the death plot score for french dispatch yeah it's, it's beautiful it's great and the fact that it didn't get an oscar nomination for production design is insane and everything that is wrong with you know this yeah system. that was a strong that was a like, strong production design year but yeah, yeah well it got but a lazi nomination there, there you, you go, go. And, well, uh, and it would get a nomination from me too it's not go. the way you go <laughs> the bears um <laughs> the bears thank uh, you very the much bears. um all right <laughs> that was my number five uh we've already said dan's number four which is asteroid city so zach we're at your number four my number four is fantastic mr fox um which was actually the first one that i rewatched when i started rewatching all these i rewatched these out of order um i watched in uh, order well, I mean, I've seen all of them so many times that yeah, that makes um, sense for you. It was mostly like when I was rewriting when I was writing this piece, I thought, okay, I'll revisit the ones that I haven't seen mm. quite so recently, so they're fresher in my mind. Uh -huh. And as is always the case with somebody like Wes Anderson, I'm like, why don't I rewatch this more? Um, you <laughs> know, when I put it on, um, this is like the perfect marriage of filmmaker and subject material. Um, the illustrations by Quentin Blake, which have mm. always been so integral to the success of Roald Dahl's work, provide a great blueprint for Wes Anderson to then put in all of his visual motifs and eccentricities um, and create this absolutely 
astonishing stop motion animated world. Then on top of that, the screenplay that he writes with Noah Baumbach yeah. is so perfect. And, you know, again, adds in all of these predilections of Anderson's, you know, the, the tortured relationship with the father, um, the, uh, the, the droll sense of humor, right? Mm -hmm. The sort of um, asides to the audience. Um, all of those things are there and without sacrificing the core story of the book. Um, and I just, you know, so often animation is thought of as this um, lesser medium mm. in filmmaking, or it's often just sort of dismissed as for children. Um, but this is one of the films that really makes the case for why animation is an art form that deserves to be on the same level as quote unquote regular movies, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's just as much care and attention to detail that goes into every shot of this movie as there is in any of the live action films that he's made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I mean, I assume everybody has this on their list. Um, it is man. my number four as well. It, oh, right. <laughs> All right dude. And it's my number three. All oh. right. Well, there you go. It's so absurdly almost perfect. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking of Rob production design, good Lord. <laughs> oh, my uh, God. Yeah. Uh, the Noah Bombeck of it all is so damn funny. <laughs> when you think about this in retrospect to the end of white noise with a yep. giant song and dance number in a supermarket. Mm -hmm. um, wow. I, oh my God. Yes. It's uh, almost absurd, almost like absurd, but it's fantastic <clears throat> and funny. Um, again, mm -hmm. another absolute killer, perfect banger despot score. Like, come on. I, I think almost any of us could be like, this is my favorite score of his of a Wes Anderson movie with <laughs> five different, you know, movies. Um and I mean it's basically, you know, it's chicken run, but like a little bit different. Um Clooney proves oh. to be a stunning addition. Mm -hmm. Uh but I would only I almost only like ever want him to do this and like that's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't. I. I don't want him back. I don't know. I don't live want, action would be interesting. I. I guess, but it would be. It would feel I, obvious. There's something obvious about it. I don't know. I just. I. I just want to see Clooney in more things because we don't get to see him that much. Yeah. But I think his voice work in this is it's flawless, and stunning. Plus. Weirdly enough, it's Streep that feels not like a weak link. Oh, don't do it. Don't but she's. It. She's just fine. She's, she's 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 very good but it's like hey, you. she always is we don't it didn't need to be her in a in a way that Clooney is probably could have been Francis and it would have been here. yeah well, Perfect. yeah yeah I get it but then I mean like Defoe and that's the rat and Gambin's great as the villain you know what I mean and, and uh, Michael Gambin is perfect yeah Defoe is great. That fucking rat. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> no, I, so I, I, love, I, I love this. I love this. I love how much of stop motion is in Asteroid City. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's because of this. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I'm not a really big fan of Isle of Dogs. It would be my lowest pretty easily. I don't hate Ooh. it, but I don't like it because mm. it means mostly because of this. Because this is no, oh, yeah, that's fair for me. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's it's a perfect not genre because animation isn't a genre, but it is a perfect format, I think, for for Anderson. Yeah, uh, especially with how production design obsessed that he yeah. is. And also, should... too, just the meticulous nature of stop motion. Exactly. It is, it's it's I mean, just yeah. built for yeah. why. It's, yeah. it's it was in it was an inevitability. Yeah, it's like we're getting here, right? 
And it's a perfect <laughs> marriage. It's a perfect marriage. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Daniel's your number three. Yeah, it's my number three. And for like all the reasons that Eric said, it just feels like another just perfect playground mm-hmm. for him to just do whatever he wants. And he can make it, he make every piece of everything look exactly how it wants. And it, it, it works just as well as you would expect it to. And banger score, the, the, Looney doing that dialogue at like mm. like 1930s screwball speed like oh, yeah. that is some Rosalind Russell shit like it <laughs> you can't even yeah. talk faster than that and still be able to understand it it's it's just fantastic and everything about it feels so perfectly realized mm. um it, it 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 it's hard for me to like fully love it because like of all his movies, it it kind of does feel like the most hermetically sealed. Like everything is so precise. Yeah. But it also kind of works somehow with the overall style of the thing. And it's just, I think it's great. And I love that he made, like that this is a kid's movie. Yeah, it's, it's a, a kids fit. movie for almost like for adults. Like yeah, like and it's a it's a kids movie for kids, but it gets to be all different kinds of weird, just as weird and eccentric as dolls books are. Yeah, which you don't often get in no. the adaptations of them on screen. So it, yeah. I, yeah, it it's hard to find much fault wrong with it. Yeah, it's my number two. Um, I'm the highest of everybody here. I love this movie. It was my number one for a long, long time. Then the recent rewatches moved it down just a little bit. Um, but it, I mean, just a two for Christ's sake. But um, I, I, I love this movie. I think, I mean, like Clooney was in his era where he was just knocking out performance after performance. But this was like a, this is like bringing the the great sort of snake oily salesman vibes that he had with the Cohen brothers into the Wes Anderson world and being able to sell his family Schwartzman's out of, you know, just giving a, a hilarious performance as this very angsty, like, you know, teenager um, Streep is the the sort of calm one in the middle that I kind of, I, I really, I like Meryl. I don't think it's like a wonderful performance, but I think it's a very steady performance from Meryl. I think Gambit and in the, the actors that play the villains are hilarious. I think, you know, the idea of, of what the cuss or you cuss him with me and stuff like that. I think that's love that. What a wonderful so way of like getting around using language and, and, and using it. I think that it's uh, the best thing that Noah bombach has been a part of screen w- play wise um, in his entire career. Um, and I think that it has a lot to do with, wow. with Wesley Anderson. If not that, then Francis Ha, because he's yeah. working Agreed. with he's working with uh, better writers than himself but um <laughs> you know just saying wow. um but i think it's a perfect adaptation dan was absolutely right on money and like to be able to 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 you know actually adapt doll's books into in not just a being of willy wonka machine and, and not understanding the complexities of that wonderful kids writer and um i i just i i love the score that's probably my favorite of the of the display scores. Uh, I just love see. The, I love the <laughs> I love the I love the 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 needle drops in here. The like Beach Boys needle drops and yes. stuff like that. I think like low key we don't talk enough about how Wes Anderson is a wonderful director in placing needle drops in his movies. We talk about a he lot of his is- contemporaries. But he is I mean, as good, if not better, than Tarantino at that. Yeah. I mean, and they and they're not the same thing, but like he also in like the first half of his career had a really like if you didn't have a Rolling Stone song in his movies, then like there was it wasn't a Wes Anderson film, it seemed like. Like you think we we mentioned the stones a lot with Scorsese. It was like when you're doing the rewatch and Zach, you did it too. It's like there's a lot of Rolling Stones in these movies. Uh, that's yeah. interesting. Um, I think the like the the PD sequence of the zippity 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 zippobe, and then like Gambin coming in here. What is that song? It's a bag song, PT. 
bad song. Bad song Peter. It's so funny. It's just, uh, it's the movie. I, I, I would have, I would have put it in Best Picture. I would have given it the animated Oscar. I would have given it mm-hmm. adapted screenplay that year. I would have, I would have given Wes Anderson a director nomination. I think it's, it's, it's so well done. It's way better than freaking Up. So yeah. Um, I didn't saying. want to say it, but then you said it, so I yeah, I said it because it's correct. I don't know if I can kill that, that old man far. to bring in Fantastic Mr. Fox. You know? No, I I can completely agree to that. Yeah. So all right, we that was Eric's number four, and uh, so it'll be at my number four, which is probably going to be a movie that was on everybody's list. But Rushmore. Um, I love Rushmore. Um. I forget every time about Rushmore and how absolutely funny it is. It's such a funny damn movie. It, I, I just, you know, Schwartzman sort of introduction the, you know, Max Fisher as a, as a character is just so rich and so deeply of its, of not just of his time, but I just think of, of, of any boy that's just just trying to skirt by in this world and trying to be a phony and, but I think, like you know, beyond just the, the the love triangle stuff, or on the 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 hijinks with with Bill Murray in the film, and and you know, to chase after this woman's heart, uh, and also the the dark theater productions that he's doing at both of these high schools of Serpico and then what almost seems like Platoon, <laughs> um, which are fantastic. Oh my god! I, I what I love most about this movie is the the sincerity and the relationship between Max and his father. And I think that that doesn't get talked about enough. And it's those little scenes that, especially at the Christmas time when he's, when he's in there and he's, he's basically like given up on school and life and he's like, and he's become his apprentice and he's still like 16 years old or, or 15 years old or whatever at the time. And he's like, I've given up on life and I'm just going to be a barber just like my dad. Um, I find it to be really funny, but then I also find it to be really sad and sweet at the same time. So um it's it's the film right after bottle rocket which and i think that like bottle rocket is a is is a is a very good debut and and but i feel like this is when you really first get to see the style of wes anderson what is to come and um and, and that happens a lot you know with uh with directors especially of the 90s you see their first film it sort of has like a like like a, a sheen or a style that is connected to like maybe like a reservoir dogs or other films of you know other great debuts of the time you know sex lies and videotapes from soderbergh and others you know and it has a way to hook an audience in to get there but then it's the second feature reminds me of like fincher where like the second feature for fincher is like oh that's what a david fincher film's gonna be or and then so rushmore to me is like this is what is to come throughout the entirety of it plus it's also a really good film and um great collaboration on the screenplay with him and, and Owen Wilson. So that's my number four. Uh, well, it, you know, you said a lot of other people have it on their list. So it's my number two. Oh. Um, so, and I'll also say that, you know, you brought up bottle rocket and that's the one that I'm the most bummed to not be able to talk about because um, I love that movie and, you know, it's, it's hard for me to not have it in my top five Wes Anderson's. Um, and I think it's one of the best debut films ever made um, mm. because of how well written it is. Mm. Um, uh, he talks about how um, he was ready to shoot the movie once they got it to James L. Brooks and Brooks spent a year of telling them, keep working on the script, like get it as good as it can be. And it is, but you're right that Rushmore is the fulfillment of what his unique talent could be. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I part of why I love this movie so much is because I was a bit of a Max Fisher in high school. Um, I was a very precocious uh, suit and tie wearing teenager who directed very mature high school plays and uh, didn't do very well uh, with grades um, and tried to befriend adults as well. Um, oh, but like, it sounds like an autobiography. Right I know. Oh, I don't know how Wes knew that's who I would become um, when he made this film. Um, but I think that um, the the thing that I really love about this movie is how dangerous it feels. And that's a thing with Wes's first three films. There's this kind of like 
there's a nastiness and an edge to it mm -hmm. that sneaks up in very unexpected ways. Um, and also just the whole Bill Murray of it. Man. Like, you know, he saw in Bill Murray something that had been there in Groundhog Day and even mm -hmm. things like Ghostbusters, but had never really been fully explored. This just guy who has been beaten down by life and like cannot get through it anymore um and you know i think that what he deals with in this film is just like humanizing these people in a way that i find um very moving and touching you know because mm -hmm. they are just like on the surface caricatures but there's a real depth of, of feeling and humanity yeah that he gives to them yeah just like him jumping in that pool and you know the shot of him in there and then but also every time he's in the car with the with his sons and <laughs> just sucks. hitting the shit out of him it's like you can feel <laughs> like he just wants to put a gun to his mouth and end it like it's yeah. so funny but it's so sad does anyone eric uh dan do you have this on your list no okay <laughs> All right. i R rushmore is the one that i like deviate most from most other people on and it's because i a little bit of jason schwartzman in this era goes a long way for me and oh, okay. he's the fucking lead <laughs> so <laughs> that's fair that's while fair. this movie i like a lot of things about it and bill murray is just just so freaking brilliant mm -hmm. i i can't it it's the one it's the biggest it's the one thing of his in movies that thing. i like the best that i have never wanted to watch again no after seeing makes, it the first time that makes yeah. sense. you're like the uh brian cox character you just can't stand <laughs> I, I really just can't. i love cox's eye when he's in the hospital and he's like, <laughs> what do you want you know what i mean like yes. <laughs> See, that's where that nastiness comes out. It's yeah, just exactly. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, it's my number one. What? Ooh. Okay. Uh I yeah, talk about needle drops. I'm sorry, but this is the best soundtrack of any Wes Anderson movie ever, ever. They are flawless to yeah. a to really? a point that's almost disturbing because <laughs> to to zach's point this is only his second movie and his first three do have such a punk sensibility especially mm. uh bottle rocket mm. and and this this was as as you said this sort of like here is his second movie and you know really with in connection with with Owen Wilson and and Bottle Rocket and 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 getting that deal and like here is the the promise of what you know Wes Anderson could be and and will be um i think it is again the one in the many of his homages to other things his love of of other films and filmmakers the level of Harold and Maude in this is wild. Mm -hmm. Not just, you know, the older, younger romance, which is not Harold and Maude levels, but mm -hmm. Pat Stevens just yeah. kind of really doesn't, you know, it it underlines it quite a bit. Yeah. Um I I but I think the 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 last needle drop at the dance is the most perfect of them all um i again i love this is this is anderson's wheelhouse of finding yeah. specific actors i i am not and was not a max fisher in any way um and you know all of these are very classic straight hetero oriented and heteronormative <laughs> stories you're not going to have a cool romantic version of a teacher student romance really that 
is same sex that would never have the treatment like this. So you're, you're, you're always, if, if you're a gay person, you're, you're reading between lines and you're, you're kind of just moving the, the parts around a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, 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 and this, this was just something that kind of did that. I mean, I was obviously way out of high school, but not that way. It was like nine years. Eight years? Yeah. Oh my God. Actually, this is this is old. This movie's 98. This yeah. is an old movie. <laughs> no, no it's comment. from in the 1900s, as the kids <laughs> on TikTok say. The 1900s. Go fuck yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So I I it's sometimes it's really easy to 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 put yourself in a, a character, and sometimes it's not. Uh and I don't know why, but I just I love the rebelliousness of this and yeah. it's so audacious and funny and I don't, I don't know. It just, it's, it's so foundational for, yeah. for Anderson because every one of his movies after this, you can see every bit, you can see all the trademarks are there and it really started with Rushmore more so than Bottle Rocket. Even. Yeah, I yeah. don't know. I I love every performance. It's still so gross that Murray did not get nominated, but I think his performance in this and the attention that he got is why Lost in Translation yeah, yeah. absolutely never would have happened without this. Absolutely, yeah. this was this was a big like turning a point for him. Come back, yeah. it was in like the best possible way, yeah. uh, and and he's yeah, he's he's perfect. Yeah, he's great. He's great. The film. Olivia just, Williams also so good. She's yeah. very, mm, oh very God. good. Yeah. Like, so the, the saying that he had gotten a car accident and he's got like jam on his head. It'd be in there. It's so, yeah. it's so goddamn good. So I good. did that once. I did do that once. <laughs> I, I faked a car accident. There you go. Oh God. So like had to like very, show it. Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, it was to get to a screening last week. Uh, so. <laughs> Which was weird. I mean, really wanted to see no hard feelings. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> um, we're down to Dan and Eric's number twos, and Zach and mine number one. I feel like it's going to be the same film, but I could be wrong. I feel so like gonna, since it hasn't been mentioned anywhere, it hasn't been mentioned. There's really? a big film that hasn't yes. been mentioned. Dan Bayer, what's your number two? So when I was talking about how Ray Fiennes gave probably the best performance in any U.S. Anderson and film, I side-eyed you a little and for you it. side-eyed me, and I'm like, there's one other that's competing for that title, that is Gene Hackman in The Royal Tenenbaums. Um, I just, I just it, 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 perfect movie is perfect. I don't know like what else to say about it. Yeah. Um. Other than that, I miss Angelica Houston in movies a lot. Yeah, she really only um, exclusively works with with him. Really. And her, the last time that she was on screen for him was a long time ago. Now, Darjeeling Limited, I believe. Yeah, that yeah, was it. yeah. Mm-hmm. And I love Gene Hackman in this so, so, so much. Yeah. Like with Bill Murray for Rushmore, it's gross that he didn't get nominated for an Oscar that year. Mm-hmm. It's it's he it's so perfect. I mean, everything about that performance is this is how you act in a, a Wes Anderson movie. Yeah. And if you're looking for fucking emotion, I mean, he has it yeah. pouring out of his coming out of every in some of those scenes i i think the narration from alec baldwin is what chef's kiss yeah may he only do narration for movies from this point out <laughs> um, you know just please he's it's perfect he has a perfect voice for it and the cadence yeah. is great um i love that it's set up like a book and they make constant references to the books about and written by everyone in it. Mm. Uh, the production design is so that game closet is just a treasured trove. I love it so much. Ben Stiller 
maybe never been better than I he is agree. in this movie. Um, both Owen and Luke Wilson also I was say Luke Wilson. never been better than they are in this. Mm-hmm. Luke Wilson. Luke Wilson. <laughs> yeah. In this movie, when he cut off that beard and that hair, <laughs> mm. that was a moment in time for <laughs> for younger Daniel. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, it was Daniel but, Bayer at the time? Yes, think. it was. Um, this, <laughs> but also like that that scene, and mm. you know the scene that I'm talking about. Yeah. The way that that scene is unlike anything else that yeah. Wes Anderson has ever done before or since. Yeah, and it's so effective, so yeah. ridiculous ridiculously effective that that cut to no sound yeah. and the the unhinged camera handheld camera is beautiful it's another flawlessly constructed movie uh, danny glover is hilarious mm-hmm. and so sweet and name a more iconic performance than Gwyneth Paltrow in this movie. Thank mm. you. I her slow that, motion walking that right off the bus. Eyeshadow. That mm. eyeshadow and that haircut is everything. If y'all were not alive at this time, you don't know. You don't know. <laughs> Lives were changed. The number okay? of Margo Tenenbaum Halloween costumes and <laughs> dress don't. costumes. Are you kidding me with that jacket <laughs> and that hair? Yeah. Eric, what do you love about it? This could, you know, is easily be number one yeah. as much as Rushmore mm-hmm. for me. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, I think this is I think this is the movie that anybody would acknowledge as the quintessential Wes Anderson. Yeah, uh, I think the it, one that brought him in the mainstream even more than his oh, first sure. two films. Yeah. And again, yes, Needle Drop, the, the Nico Needle Drop. Oh, God. Oh, it's that's that has been like copied. Yeah. so many times never equaled but it just nothing will ever really hit quite like that and yes gene hackman should have been nominated it's one of i think maybe a, a top three performance yeah. of it it's mm-hmm. insane but i am obsessed with gwyneth paltrow in this Come the on. absolute blueprint for <laughs> Saoirse ronan <Yes>. god <laughs> damn performance and role my god, god. yes yeah. in every possible uh, way um and again also he's trucking in ideas and concepts of what you know incest and inappropriate relationships throughout that are done in a way that are careful but not too careful but not exploitative or weird i mean weird in just the understandable for the the, the, natural yeah but it's again not not i don't know it's 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 an always an observant eye yeah i think that's that's the reason why something like that works really well yeah um and yeah like you're saying dan just (laughs) the, the 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 book element and he does it with Asteroid City too, where you're watching it going, you know that none of that it's not real, but it's being treated like this was a real thing that happened. Here is the telling of that. He does it and in Budapest that, too. Yeah, that can see and French Dispatch. Mm-hmm. So successful for him mm-hmm. in in a way and consistently. I, I don't know how. I don't know how. But yeah, it, but it is. Tarantino even kind of rips it off because then he then. Tarantino starts doing the chapters thing. Yeah. You know what I mean, and, and but it's but it's like, you know that's different. I think that's a little different than this because this is is being quite literal. Well, like, no, no, no. I understand. Like it's a different like this it, is something that that we that we all know of in the world of when history, I'm, which is super funny. Yeah. When and I'm, Ben Stiller did Zoolander and this in the same year. So can you believe the range. About the fucking range. Your yeah. fave could never. <laughs> <laughs> Zoolander is one of my like all time favorite comedies. I think it is geniusly yeah. stupid. Um, you get a nice and, coffee and go pouring gasoline on yourself all the time, don't you, Eric? I mean, literally all the time. You were Hello, doing that before, uh, Alexander Skarsgård. Yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> Again, casting. Stiller and the boys that play his kids. <laughs> Those what? boys. Oh, my look, God. Because it's more than just more. the wigs, which are wigging tracksuits. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Those oh. matching tracksuits. Oh, my God. <laughs> they are just, their personalities are in line. They are in mm-hmm. tune. And it is so hard to do with young actors because they're going to be precocious or you're going to see every single thing they're doing. And it's never the case with yeah. him. Yeah. Zach, quickly, I know you got to get going here. Oh, uh, it's so. okay. I mean, you know, I, like this is my number one. And um, it was an easy number one for me just because um, there are certain movies that are so foundational to me as a person and as a film goer and as a, a person who makes films and writes about films. And this was one of them. And um, all Wes Anderson movies I find to be nakedly emotional. Mm. Um, this is the one that brings me to tears at the end every time. And it's yep. because of that scene at the end between Ackman and Ben Stiller. Yeah. And, you know, you think about it, like you could see that scene coming from a mile away. Right. And mm-hmm. yet it's so earned, you know, because of everything that Anderson has done leading up to it mm-hmm. as a, as a screenwriter, as a director, um like i think what 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 struck me so much when the first time i saw this movie as a young man was um how specific the vision was and that's always been the thing with his films that he's never Mm -hmm. compromised is you know the world looks very unique through the eyes of wes anderson right Mm -hmm. the worlds that he creates um the way he uses color and symmetrical angles and dioramic compositions. And yet at the core of all of that is this very relatable story of family dynamics, right? Even though it is like so specifically through his lens and, you know, it's funny, it's sharp. Um, There's that still that sense of danger uh, that he has in his early films with just like the the outrageous things that Gene Hackman does and says mm. throughout the film. And yet right in the center of it is this just nakedly emotional heart. Mm. Um, and that's why it's just, it's a movie that I've returned to over and over and over and over again. And it never gets old for me. Yeah. Pointing back to just what Eric was saying earlier. Uh, I wasn't trying to say that like, you know, Tarantino just like ripped it off, but I was just saying it's like, like it's this influence and they're totally different because of the meticulous style in which Anderson, you know, literally creates this book. And then, I mean, like, you know, he's copying back over to it later. I love the opening of, of Grand Budapest where it's like a little girl sees that the author's dead, then opens up the book. It then starts with, you know, his, in the Wilk- the Wilkinson stuff. And it's like a, it's a story within a story within a story within a story. This is just more a little bit more straightforward than anything. And of course it has that great Alec Baldwin narration, uh, like Dan was mentioning. Uh, um, yeah. And I'll say also like to the point of it, if, of, of the conceit of saying this was based on a novel, um, <laughs> the, the <laughs> film, the screenplay is so dense and yeah. every single character, even mm-hmm. like the smallest ones, like Pagoda. Yes. Oh Hotel Dorman. They're so specifically realized that it really does feel as though this was, you know, out of Dickens or, yeah. you know, some great uh, Jane Austen novel, right? Just like yeah. the, the specificity of the world that he creates and of each character yeah. in it. No, I, I also feel like Jesse Armstrong really <laughs> watched oh. this a lot mm-hmm. before creating Succession. Yeah, because yeah. because Royal is such a dirty dog. And, there are and, and they're all vibes in this, and this obviously entire... royal tenement vibes in succession for yeah sure. but i mean I, that's what i love about hackman so much he's he's so good in this i mean the conceit of him basically saying that he's you know he's only got a, a month to live i mean that that tracking shot on the street where where houston comes back in and out of the frame yeah, because he keeps so... going back and forth on it it's so freaking funny it's so I, funny it's so it's so good in, in the range of the just all the emotions that you're gonna feel really in this movie. Um, I agree with Zach. I mean that that scene at the end where it's this 
the, the you know, just sweeping through the entire almost street and you get the, uh, you know, a final look or a final taste of each character leading up to, you know, spark plug being handed um, to Chaz by Royal. And it's such an, um, you know, an emotional scene because, and it's built up and it's so subtle and it kind of just comes out of nowhere, but it hits you so hard. And I think as I've gotten older, I've come back to this movie. It's so rewatchable, but that scene just that hits you because, you know, when you're older, you, you, you're not like, as much as I love fantastic Mr. Fox, I think that that's like a young man's movie. of just like, it's a lot of fun and it's, you know, it's vibrant colors and it's animated and everything. And then this is like, Oh, an adult I've experienced loss in my life before, you know, I've experienced it where there's years in my life or, or uncertainties. And I think of, you know, Luke Wilson's character a lot. And, you know, and then of course, you know, when it's, you know, wonderful performance in there too, all those characters are completely broken. And weirdly enough, this, dirty bastard of a father it comes back and kind of pieces them all together and it's so taboo the luke wilson and uh gwyneth you know storyline but yet it even they go works. out of their way to be yeah. like they're not actually siblings Things. because every but, single time that hackman introduces her he says you're my adopted daughter yeah just, yeah exactly I mean, that's kind of like the edge to this movie that i love it's like <laughs> yeah there's that scene early on when he comes back to the house and he suggests going to the grandmother's uh, and you, yeah, I never, oh, went. Just, I never got invited. Essentially, yeah. like, I mean, I mean, not blood so, related, you know. Yeah, I, I didn't think you would have any interest in it. You know, it's just like the casual cruelty. Yeah, that he, you know, but it's like because Hackman's such a good actor, it never comes across as mean spirited. You know, yeah. no, the just, tone is always exactly right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, perfect. And, and he's so, walking such a fine line, Hackman, with that performance. Yeah, because yeah. he's got to be lovable, but he's also an asshole. You know what I mean? Like, especially like Danny Glover, like the the scene where he's in the the kitchen and he knows he can like get away with basically yeah. saying any dirty thing to him and catches him <laughs> in that. I, I love that. I love Danny Glover walking up the stairs and that like that that music playing as like I've caught him um, and, and everything. It's it's such a a great great film. And then, yeah, I mean, the needle drops, the stone stuff, but then like the, the Van Morrison song to end the film, mm. and then that slow motion of just closing the gate, and then it's like closing of a book, essentially. It's it's so well done. And yeah, I mean, Stiller, yeah, talk about that range indeed. I mean, doing probably like the biggest idiot and one of the biggest idiots in cinema history in Zoolander, and then, and then doing this very nuanced and heartbreaking performance and uh and yeah i mean angelica houston everybody i truly think that wes anderson at a certain point later like with the rest of his career needs to get owen wilson back into a writer's room and then write something else because i think that they write some they, those three first films that they wrote together are some of his most interesting complex and dangerous pieces of work that you could ever work to start your career and uh and, you know one's about like uh a, a high school kid trying to you know have sex with his teacher and the other one's about this you know this ancestral relationship at the core of of both of those films and 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 a pretty disgusting you know royal tenenbaum as, as your as the you know the patriarch of this family and yet it all works so i i and i i think a lot of that early stuff from you know them being um students at university of texas together and, and kind of finding each other it 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 feels like we're two young guys we can write whatever we want and we're going to make it work somehow and uh and if you don't like it well shit it's you know it's not like we had really any skin in the game to begin with and it feels very like you know it feels like you know very like st- stakes are very low and they can just you know be very free and i kind of like that Mm -hmm. Um, and then Wes gets that comfortability because they're such big hits and then it gets to do more meticulous things down the road. So, but, um, but yeah, no, that's our top five Wes Anderson films. That was a painless endeavor. Um, (laughs) (laughs) more so than the animals that are in a Wes Anderson film. That's for sure. I don't Um, know. I find it enjoyable. I mean, like I saw Royal Tenderbombs came out when I was 17 and I remember seeing it in the theater when it came out and it was one of those sort of like light bulb moments. Like, yeah, I don't think I really fully 
get this, but I know I liked it. Yeah. <laughs> and I know that this feels like something different from anything else that I've ever seen. And I want to figure out why. Yeah. I think that's why he was so popular with my group of, of film school students, mm-hmm. because I was, I was like 12 years old when the Royal Tenenbaums came out. I didn't see it in the theaters, but I, I saw it when it came out on Criterion, of and, course. you know, and I thought, okay, well, this must be an important, film that i need to watch it is uh, at a young age and like you dan it's like not everything in it um i didn't get everything yeah yet because i wasn't mature enough yet to and yet because of how different it was from everything Mm -hmm. else i knew that i was into it like i was just on this movie's wavelength and i i think that's why wes's wes anderson's movies speak to me so much yeah no for sure for sure well that's all the wes anderson talk that we can have for this episode uh because we are drawing to a close so which is longer than a wes anderson film hey exactly (laughs) i was Um, i was was, can can we make it like like, all right we came close (laughs) we came close uh eric can you tell everybody out there where we can find you and all your work please Yes, at awardswatch.com. Uh, and so I don't forget this yep. time. <laughs> you can subscribe to the Awards Watch newsletter, which comes yeah. out twice a week, which just has the highlights of everything happening, whether it's predictions or reviews or interviews. We just obviously closed the phase one of Emmy season interviews. Mm-hmm. Tons of great stuff there. I highly encourage uh checking that out yeah and you also can read um pieces like uh zach's um well, yeah, ranking for west anderson that, but, yeah. <laughs> for but you sure. can get it all in a one-stop shop and two emails a week it's not too it's not painless it's, I mean, it's, no it is painless if it was uh, or, or, i mean yeah it's not it's yeah, it's painless sorry it's been it's been a long episode the people yeah wait, yeah it's just two emails two emails that's it it's not it's not that bad yeah. Clickety click, there black and black. Yeah, exactly. Give, then me, you get the, to give read... me those clicks, please. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you get to read all of our all of our work, and and I mean, Eric's Oscar predictions are going to be coming quicker they are, they and are quicker. Already and predictions, yeah, and already yes. out. So right halfway done. Yeah, the best then... picture first because sometimes you have to feed the people. Exactly. And making them, you got to get them more d'oeuvres a little bit before you can give them everything else. Um, yeah. Dan Bear, can we? find where you are on the internet sir yeah i am on twitter at dance and dan on film on letterboxd and post at dance and dan all right check out all of dan's work it's a great follow speaking of great follows zach loss where can we follow you on the internet uh, uh for as long as it's still in existence you can follow me on twitter <laughs> that's fair yeah, um, yeah. And, Dan's um, been saying that for two months, three months on the show, and yet it's still alive. It's hanging it's on by a thread. Somehow. It's still alive. <laughs> Just through the, the sheer um, uh, you know, determination of all of us still using it. Right? I think it's Elon trying to prove Dan wrong at this point. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> well, because you know we what? Know then I will keep saying it. <laughs> it'll listening. never die then. We know he's listening. So, um, <laughs> But you can find me. Um, at Twitter, Letterboxd, Instagram, Facebook, and all that stuff at Zach Laws. And uh, you can find my work, like the Wes Anderson ranking at Awards Watch. You can go read that and find what his 6th or 11 is. If he gets mm-hmm. that all the way on this list. Um, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, or Ryan McQuaid 77. You can find all my work here at Awards Watch. Other places like uh, The Playlist and Phil Speaker, a bunch of other places. Next week, we're going to be doing uh, a little review for Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Just a little bit, you know, not too long on that one. Then we're going to be talking about our favorite films of the year so far, because we're already at the halfway point. And um, so that should be pretty fun to talk about that. And uh, yeah, and so that'll do it for this week's show. Thank you all so much for listening, and we'll see you all next time.